From down under. Do. Or do not. Do not try. G'day, mate. How you going? Alright, folks. Welcome to the one, the only, Fanther from down under. G'day, mate. How are you? This is Adam. And joining us all the way from the United States of America is the one, the only, Co-host of one of the most amazing shows when it comes to Star Wars literature and Star Wars in general. Part of the Star Wars report, it is Star Wars Beyond the Films co-host, Mark Herleman. Buddy, how are you? Oh, I am doing phenomenal, man. If you're not having fun, you're working too hard, and I refuse to work too hard. <laughs> no worries. And just off air, we're just talking about uh, the success of some great films that are going out there right now. Now, one which, unfortunately, I fell asleep in. The other day here in Australia, because I'd worked about 13 hours straight, and they said, uh, mate, come and see that Endgame movie. I said, did you mean the Highlander Endgame? No, 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 not that one, mate, the other one. <laughs> and, and I went, okay, I, I've got to see this, because I figured they'd do something smart and get Arnold Schwarzenegger in there to take over from Tony Stark and go, no, no, come on, Thanos, got you now. <laughs> you fell asleep? Yeah, I did. Oh, serious, man. serious, serious. That's, that's rough. Anytime you work 12 hours or more, he, you know, you don't realize how much of a toll that takes, especially when you've been going nonstop during that time. Then you sit down and you're just like, oh. I remember my recliner was the devil. If I sat in that thing for more than five minutes, I was out. It didn't matter if I had something on TV that I needed to watch or not. I was like, as soon as I put my legs up, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I fell asleep when um, I won't not spoil it, obviously, folks. But there is a Professor Banner in there, and I was, I was you know, I was take, taken away by just how genius this guy. I mean, he's always genius, obviously, but um, but yeah, that, that, just that scene alone, and then it, all of a sudden I was out, and I didn't wake up until <laughs> uh, till Tony goes, "I am, I am Spider Man, Superman." <laughs> See, and and when I worked at the theater, we would preview late. After I was done doing all the janitorial work, and it was like two, three in the morning sometimes. <laughs> I fell asleep through uh, Superman versus Batman, uh, the Harry Potter movies. I was like, oh God, no, uh, Deadpool. Uh, there's so many good movies that I just was like, oh my God. As soon as my feet got up on that chair in front of me, I was doomed. Just doomed to snore. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, man. It's natural. We're all, we're all, um, you know, only able to stay up for so long, I think, these days, you know, and there's only so many movies that will, you know, even this is an exciting movie, don't get me wrong, but I need to, I think, just wait till the crowds die down, have quite a bit of coffee, go in and just watch it straight for the three hours. Yeah, I think I think when it comes to the crowds, you've got to be willing to sit up front, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh when I go, that tends to be what happens is, you know, it doesn't matter what time we get there. Usually you go in there and it's just like, wow, password puzzle in here. There's like maybe two seats open. Uh, uh, but you get to that front row and it's like, bam, there's rows of the seats. So we end up sitting, if we can, in the in the last of the front rows or, you know, anywhere in that section. And, and granted, you know, you are looking up like this. Which I think of that experience, the only movie I've ever watched with that breakneck, because I was in the very front row with my dad watching the Hunt for Great October or uh, Hunt for Red October. <laughs> Dude, them subs coming out on that thing like, oh my god, it felt real. Uh, but Hunt you know, you can't get the same kind of experience with your regular type of films because when you have that person there on the screen, you're like, oh my god, they're masked. But if you can get to that mindset <laughs> where it's it's not the end of the world, you can find a, a place to get comfortable without falling asleep. That's probably the only way you can really do those early, you know, those oh, massive yeah. early showings where there's everybody and their dog and you're just like, oh, my God, I hope you won't be on it because man, you are on me today. <laughs> <laughs> Red October. I actually remember seeing that in the cinemas. Um, we saw it in the drive in and that, that was that was great enough because you had those massive steel speakers that used to sit on your window and you'd crank them yeah. up. A little AM speaker, basically. And my old man would go, listen to this, Adam, you're going to love this. Wait, 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 wait. And then you hear Sean in those scenes where he goes, give us your ping, Lieutenant. Give us your ping now, please. And he hears, boop, boop. And then, and then I'm starting, start, I'm, I'm a kid, you know, I've just had school all day. I'm like, oh, yeah, Dad's really good, eh? And then I started to doze off a bit and his, And the you know, submarines are crashing. He goes, you just did a crazy Ivan, Shanga. <laughs> Such a good movie. That's no, great movie. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, so that's I keep thinking when I go to those type of movies and I'm going on the early one, first day showing and stuff. You know, you do not expect it to be 
be full. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I live in a small town where you don't have to actually pre-order your tickets. There will still be some tickets. But even then, on the third showing, I'm sitting there and, you know, I'm, I'm bumping into the guys I used to work with. And they're like, yeah, man, it's so packed. We actually opened two more theaters. So, I mean, it, it did even in my small town. It did sell out all four of the first showings. So they ended up having six all together. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, it's that aspect of you got to be close. So if you're going to go and you're going to do that, pick a theater that has wide seats. Oh, because yes. that's the thing. I mean, I, I was sitting there with the guy next to me and like I, I claimed dominance right away because when I sat down, there was nobody sitting next to me. So it was like, you know, I've got my elbows on the spot. And then halfway through the movie, I noticed, you know, that his elbows like kind of coming up behind my elbow. Like he's like trying to do that quick. Like, I got this armrest now. <laughs> for you right here. And I was like, oh, really, buddy? So I'm, I'm kind of watching on the side of my eye. And as soon as he like leaned over to give his girlfriend a kiss, I just put my arm back in there like, oh, yeah, oh, man. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you're going to be uncomfortable because that's the price of going to see it early. Now, is that trade-off worth it to be non-spoilered? I mean, this is a, a definite new era of mm -hmm. media when it comes to the social media giants of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. The, the way that we can reach from, you know, one end of the globe to the other like we're doing right now is so much easier than it ever was before that – you got little d bags out there, you know, boys, girls, trolls. It don't mm -hmm. matter. I mean, my kids at school are sharing me a picture of a, one of the kids at school with Snapchat. It's like, ah, I hated this movie. Blah blah blah, blah blah blah, blah blah blah. Massive spoilers. Like, are you kidding me? You got public post. Mm -hmm. Did it to their did it to their school page. So everybody in the school that saw that got totally spoiled. It's like, man, there's just there are just people out there that are just unhappy with life and they only get thrills by hurting other people and just causing muck. It doesn't matter how bad the muck is. Mm -hmm. As long as they're flinging it some direction and it's not landing on them, they're like, <laughs> and you know, that's the danger of this era. So you got to judge that. You got to weigh that. Like, do you want to let little Johnny D bag over there spoil a bunch of stuff for you? Or are you going to want to go in and see it? And then it comes down to, you know, how well do you put on your expectations for movies? I mean, mm -hmm. me, I'm the type like, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be shocked and surprised by something, I want it to be during that moment. I don't want to lose that suspense. But at the same time, you take me to a movie with my wife, right? Like if it's an emotional impact, you get me on that second time where she hasn't watched it, and I'm like watching it, and watching her, watching it, and watching her, and thinking about what's going on with the character. I'm like, by the time it happens, I'm like, ah, I'm like this is great writing. I mean, it probably isn't, but I'm so in that moment that I'm just yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. So, I mean, that's you got to weigh this kind of you stuff, do, man. You and do. then plus, it's also who you go with. Sometimes that can ruin your, your time, man. You go with somebody that can't shut up, and you're like, dude, can't we just enjoy the movie talk about it afterwards? Come on, please. <laughs> it's so true. I mean, I think the thing is, they get so engulfed in what they're, they're doing, you know I mean? The biggest spoiler is, folks, I'm going to have to say it, because this is a Star Wars podcast, not a Marvel one. The one that comes to save the day is... The one, the only, Christoph Waltz. He comes in at the end and saves all the characters. All of the little characters. <laughs> <laughs> no, folks, that's not true. He's not in the movie, but he wishes he was. But I tell you what, something else happened this week. I got the audio book of the new Claudia Gray novel. And now I've got to say, Claudia Gray really, for me, I think brings us back to that EU feeling, the Legends writing. She really... She's got that knack for writing. I mean, she really, she's in amongst all the, the greats for me, like Timothy Zahn, Kevin J. Anderson, all those, Jude Watson, every of them. And it, well, they really we, do. We started a new hashtag for her. Claudia Gray is the new Timothy Zahn. She really is. <laughs> yes, it's true. It's true. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, she has the feeling of um, the eras that she writes in. Now, Master and Apprentice released, obviously, in the last fortnight. Master and Apprentice is a Phantom Menace prequel six years prior Fantastic story, obviously, about Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn. Uh, Qui-Gon Jinn, yeah, that's right. Qui -Gon, and what he really um, does in this is, uh, I think, as a character, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, we start to see that rift grow further, as obviously he's getting a chance to actually hand off Obi-Wan back to another master so he can join the council. So we actually start to see some of that rift that grows into the Phantom Menace. But we also start to see some of his early years with Dooku after mm -hmm. he had his first apprentice, Rael Abaros. Now, here's the big one, folks, is that apparently Claudia Gray has said that she had in mind Benjamin Bratt for that um, character while she was writing the novel, which I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. 
No, and that, and I want to say she said similar about other characters, not not about Brat, but having other characters in mind, which some of the best writers that's going in, they've got those type of plans, which is great. But you know, the way she captures not just the the background of whatever planet she's on, but the way the characters are interacting with things and the presence of the characters. I mean, I've I've complained off and on about stories that bounce back and forth between the past and in the present. And she does that, but she doesn't do it in a way that upsets me at all. It doesn't bother me because it's it's not like you're getting a complete past story. It's like you're getting glimpses of their truth, you know, their past, but you don't have to have it all because you're just getting a, a, a milestone here. We'll come back maybe to that moment in time for a little bit and then we'll jump forward like a couple mm-hmm. months or a year or so. Um, but, you know, I mean, that for me, one of the things I really dug the most was the way she changed up the direction of the relationship between Kenobi and Jin. I mean, I'm a big fan of Jude Watson's book series and the way that their relationship, it started out kind of like what we get in this book, but only when uh, Qui-Gon first picked up Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan is like almost 13. He's almost at the age where a Padawan couldn't even be picked out anymore. So when he gets picked up, there's that feeling of insecurity, this, this feeling of I don't measure up as a Padawan and who would pick me. Whereas in this one, we pick up and he's almost he's almost 18, he's 17. Jin gets the invitation, like you said, but they're never quite they're never quite Anakin and Obi-Wan. You know, the we were brothers, the the two wheels working or, or, or better yet, an hour hand and a minute's hand on the clock. You know, I mean, they're not working that mechanical yet. They definitely feel like there's there's this block between them. And. What's great is the way she gets into Jin's head because, you know, he's got this invitation, but he's still like, well, I'm failing Obi-Wan. You know, it's not just that Obi-Wan's failing me. He's a good Padawan. I'm failing him. And the other interesting dynamic there is that unlike with Watson's books, Jin didn't have an extra Padawan before he took on Obi-Wan. It was Dooku, which is a, which is a great change because I wasn't expecting that. When we get the introduction of Rail's character, Dooku and Jin are fighting in a war. And I was like, that... I had to hit the brakes. I'm like, whoa, wait, wait. The Jedi are at war before the clo- – I mean, that for me was a major change from what we had in Legends. I mean, Legends, we get to that. And in the Jude Watson series, we see a lot of the failing of the Republic's dem- uh, democracy and of the Senate and the way that they would bound the Jedi's hands. But now we're finding out that the Council was okay with sending the Jedi to war even back then for other types of principles – and then as the story's playing out, you, you get this constant, you know, butting of heads that you know already happens with Jan when we see, oh, he's the chosen one, you know. And Yoda doesn't get along with that in episode one. And we find out more about there's this backstory between those two and how when it comes to Jin getting elected, it's Yoda that's like, mm, mistake this is, but go with the council, I will. Like, you know, just like <laughs> not at all afraid to just be like, mm, told you so I did, but made a decision we must go forward now you're just like yoda's like more than happy to let the ship sink and be like told you we do you don't know what you're doing but you know, <laughs> go forward with that and i'm just like holy crap this this relationship between Jin and them and the way that Jin's looking at things and and the way he's looking at prophecy and the mysticism it all comes to a head towards the end of the book though when they start dealing with the slavery issue yes and you know what do the jedi do what authority do the jedi have what should we do and, and I knew that moment was coming when the character Rahar, uh, Rahara ends up getting recaptured, basically. She was an escaped slave, and she's against Zerka Corporation, and there's a moment to kind of jab them back and help some other slaves. And she goes in and ends up getting to a point where one of the droids of Zerka Corp, they do a face scan on her, and they recognize her, and they're like, oh, you're coming with us. And Jin's talking to the, you know, the, the political government, and they're like, wait, are you talking about a former slave? Because there's really no such thing as a former slave. And and the realities of the way slavery is okay in the Republic, even though it's abandoned, the way that the legal ease of it all allows it to happen, you know, the way that that all comes front between Jin and the council and everything, that I think was probably one of the deepest moments of the entire book, besides the when we get to the moment where we see Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon kind of finally figure it out and they, and they have that sense of oh we we do make a good team and they start picking up on things i mean those moments and the way that she 
you know, illustrates that throughout the story and gets us to those moments. It's just so beautifully done that by the time you get there, you have just such a great appreciation for their relationship. And I was honestly surprised because, like I said, Jude Watson did the same thing mm. over like 10 books. Oh, she did, you know, yeah. Obi-Wan being 13 to 17. And here comes Claudia Gray, which is one book, and it's not even a big window of time. Mm. And she's still able to deliver on that in a way that feels logical in the progression of the way the story plays out. I 100% agree. I just think we are missing one thing. And, Claudia, I have to say this if you're listening to this podcast, not that you would, but if you do, I'm glad you do. But there is one thing you did miss. You missed a scene, and it's in between where he's looking at the prophecies. You know, you know Obi-Wan's going, Master, are you looking at the prophecies? Yes, Obi-Wan. I'm looking at the Chosen One prophecy. And you can see them, you know, they're in their little, you know, hovel, doing their flicking through the books, you know. This is so interesting. The one is the one because he's a hero of the one, the one. And you can just imagine a dreadlock jet. I go, hey, Obi-Wan man, what are you doing? Oh, oh, dude. What books? That again, Qui-Gon, come on. Oh, try to study you. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. Whoa, I'm going to have to get death sticks, man. Hell with this. <laughs> Why go no, Jin? You're right. You're right. There were a couple moments where they could, where she could have easily slipped in some connections to uh, Boss. Queen. The Boss and Bran. Remember, uh, yes. Boss had Bran, which was the Mon Cal character. <laughs> Obi-Wan had a small uh, cadre of characters. I think... Uh, Galvin was one of them too, or Gavin, or, or something like that, um, which was great because in the later series that Jude Watson came into, when Kenobi went back and saw, I think it was the Gavin or Galvin character, he had like aged like yeah. like thirty years overnight because of the way the Force, you know, when all the Jedi had died, stuff, the way it hit him and the way he he took it was just so different. But <laughs> yeah, I kept I kept wondering if we were going to get like any kind of reference or even to Satine, you know, because I was I was <laughs> that was another thing that Jude Watson's series had done. Kenobi almost walked away and almost dated a chick. Like there was, those were two things that ha happened in that book. Too. When the Clone Wars was like, oh, and then there's Satine. I was like, a third. <laughs> we already got a book. And we got, to, oh my gosh, a three. Kenobi, keep it in your trousers. Oh my god. So I was waiting for like that kind of a reference too. Because, and, and, and that's another one. You know, speaking of trousers, the, the way rail. <laughs> when Jen walks in on rail when he's having his little tryst, I'm like, oh, I'm, so I'm so shocked that Jen isn't calling because Jen seems like such a, a by the book at first, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you start realizing how much sidestepping the rules he goes to, and it's it's only as you realize it through Kenobi who's mm -hmm. like, why are you sidestepping? You skip step six and seven here. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> and then you start re realize, okay, yeah, this is not as by the books, but compared to rail. Oh yeah, he's a straight A student. He really is. I mean, there's and there, we didn't have it on the council there. Something that uh, uh, I remember back in the God Crocky when we first got the figures from uh, Phantom Menace coming out, and we looked at some of these characters. It was Syrian Jedi, and we we, we Key Adi Mundy, and, and I remember my brother even saying, "Yeah, Key Muddy Undies." Like, <laughs> but, but you know, I always I always figured he would have been great if he had been voiced by a British gangster. You know, hey, hey, can I be cold, mate? Yeah, you're going down and, uh, yeah, make sure you get it all for a short hour, eh? For you make sure, yeah. <laughs> See, now, I'm not a timeliner, but I have heard a lot of people complaining on the timeline side of things that certain ages were shift. I've heard that Jin has now been has been reduced in age by 10 years, that he's 10 years younger. Mm. Uh, there's question now if, if uh, Depa was now her age has changed. Because, like, someone tracked it down and they're like, well, if for her to be on the council the way she is, that would actually make her the youngest. I was like, what? Like, blow my head kind of stuff where I, I'm not, like, too hung up on that. But there were some people that were like, you know, the timeline on that doesn't match up. But I think one thing that struck me as odd was Chancellor Raja, or Raj or whatever. Because mm. um, so, it doesn't really – doesn't feel right out the gate that you're six years from the Phantom Menace. You know, there's nothing really that sets out in stone. So immediately I'm like, really? Another chancellor? Like, this seems to be like a, a theme. What do we got? We got the Queen of Naboo. No, we got three other queens before. Then we, we see this other queen in the Clone Wars. Nope, there's three other queens between that and there in the books. <laughs> oh, it's a boss Nos now. We got three other bosses before this boss that you see. Like, like really, we just shoehorn kings and queens in every place he's got these, these type of things. And now we're doing the chancellors. And I mean, I, it, it does serve the story, but again, if I would have known more about that six year period, because I kept, when I first started, I was thinking it was much closer because, you know, he's only yeah, 17. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, 
So, so that I feel like that was a change because I thought when episode one came out, Obi Wan was like nineteen at that time. Now that would put him closer to like twenty two. Yeah. You know, so I mean, it does. It, if you are paying attention to those kind of things, it does make you stop and scratch your head. And I don't think that that necessarily is on the fault of Claudia Grace. I think that that's the approach that Del Rey is taking right now. Yes. They've been very loose when it comes to locking themselves in with stuff. They come with that approach of like, well, it, it makes it easier. I, I disagree. I think that that creates problems down the road. But I think that because they've gone that direction, I mean, we've we've got a very small, loose timeline, nothing like what we used to have at the front of the books. We have no character dramatists. I, I miss that like nobody's business. Um, you know, I used to come back to books sometimes that I hadn't read in like a, a week and a half and be like, oh, who's that one character? And I flipped the part. Oh, yeah, that's uh, Bur- Barbell. Okay, yeah, 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 I remember that character now. Get back <laughs> in the story and what I go. No, now I'm like sitting there like, who is I'm trying to flip back, trying to find their introduction and reread it. And that gets a little frustrating. But no, that, that idea of, of not locking the books down seems odd. And I think that sometimes <laughs> with some people, especially them timeliners, man, they're the ones that really notice that stuff fast. Then it's causing issues for them, which is causing them to point out these things. And, you know, I, I've said this before. Legends was not a lot of issues. It was a lot of small things that contradicted each other. They caused bigger issues down the road. We're going to have that same issue if they don't start locking things in, you know. Eventually, you're going to have to pull the plug. No, Luke can't be in five places. He's over on Achu right now. He can't be over there on Crate at the same moment. Like, I don't know. There's there's some things that got to do. Well, I mean, I guess we have seen him do force projection, so he could be at other places. But that would kill him, right? Well, this is it. The other thing, too, you got to look at is, you know, and the biggest mystery in Phantom Menace is what was Yoda doing with Yaddle? I mean, at the end of the day, that's that's what you got to really ask yourself. Oh, mm, yes, married we did. Mm, many kids. Mm, but you never see it. Mm, no. <laughs> no, really, that, that is something that jumps out. I mean, they never give us Yoda or Yaddle species. In fact, Yoda was the only one, aside from video games, you know, we get to the KOTOR and then there's uh, like Yandar and other ones that show up, but aside from going in the past, there was no other Jedi. And then all of a sudden Luke gave us Yaddle. And I think a lot of people were like, your species is so rare, we don't know what the name of it is. Or or you guys were so stupid, you don't even know the name of your own race. We're just like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and then, yeah, so I mean, either way, like it's a race that's it's not well known. You would think like you go out of your ways to try to find some way to reproduce. Maybe there's a bigger story there. Maybe Yaddle's sterile. Maybe Yoda's. Maybe the whole species was like bombed by some Sith planet or something, and they <laughs> they can live for a really long age, but they can't reproduce. So like, it, I mean, that would be a hell of a story when you think about it. I mean, <laughs> guess in uh, two thousand years and watch your race die off one at a time because you can't reproduce anymore because the Sith hosed you over for something you did to them some time ago. I mean, that would be a kind of a cool story and. and and another thing Claudia Gray does is like she she drops little hints like there's a Darth Rend that she dropped in there. Uh, she talked about the Sith and stuff when she was talking about the old holocrons of prophecy and things like that. I mean they referenced quite a few things that were pretty exciting. I was like, Ooh, what, I want to know more about this. You know, get, get you excited <laughs> for the possibility of what those trilogies by uh, the the Game of Thrones people are going to do. I mean, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, they're really good at medieval stuff. It's got to be a back in the old republic. I'm one of them. I admit. Like I think it's a no-brainer. Stick them in the old republic. They're gonna rock it. But who better to play with than the Sith? Oh yeah. And, and the thing is, the ultimate narrator to a Yoda movie would be Yoda himself. You can imagine him doing the trailer too. He goes, "Hmm, for nine hundred years, hmm, he has waited, waited. He has, hmm, revenge. He will not have." <laughs> I remember seeing that picture of the young, almost looked like a Yuzen Bong version of Yoda, where he had like dreads and it's all going back. And he's got his hands kind of like Sonic the Hedgehog all up around his armpits. And I was like, you know, I'd be down for that story. Oh, you know, hell I, yes. and think about uh, back in Legends, you know, when Luke found the Chunthor, right? The uh, Jedi big cruiser ship that was basically a floating academy that would go around from galaxy to galaxy picking up new kids, so you uh, any profitable Jedi, and they would start training them on that. They would go around. I mean, it was like, it was like the next generation, but it was with, with Jedi, basically. And then they get to Dathomir, and they crash land on the planet. Yoda's got to go and negotiate. I mean, like, yeah, I was always hoping to see more of a younger Yoda. Um, and I think, you know, the relationship that Jin has with Yoda, or not even really a relationship, it's more like the way Jin feels Yoda feels about him. Mm. Has me interested to know 
what put Yoda in that frame of mind? You know, I mean, you see certain people in life that the older they get, you know, certain things just leave them in a really negative zone, right? My grandpa was, my, my grandpa that passed away, that is, uh, was extremely racist. And I had no clue of this growing up. I grew up on the same property with him for the longest time. So I had no idea. Right. I was just grandpa was just grandpa. They talked and they said really bad jokes and all sorts of stuff. And there's a story about when my grandpa went to pick up a hitchhiker. Right. And it was an African-American gentleman. My grandpa thought he was doing this great civic duty. Right. And so he goes and picks the guy up and he takes him down and he goes through uh, Sheridan into Willamina, which where grandpa heads to on his way home. And my grandpa always stops at a bar because my grandpa was a raging alcoholic, you know, racist alcoholic goes together hand in hand. Great story. Right. Uh, so my grandpa goes to the bar and he tells the guy, you know, hey, I'm going to stop in here, get a drink real quick. We'll come back. I'll take you wherever you need to go. Well, my grandpa's in the bar. He's watching the news. It turns out the guy's an escaped convict. <laughs> so this doesn't help my grandpa's outlook because now he's just like, they're all escaped convicts. It's like, no, no. But there's just certain people that their twisted point of view gets supported by the things in their life or the lack of people confronting that. And they grow up to be super old. And like, I mean, it would be interesting to see what makes Yoda tick. That is definitely a story that I think people would be interested in. I dare say if you were to take that story and if you were to put it in with where they put Solo in that same short amount of time, I think you wouldn't have had the same issue because people would have been more curious about a young Yoda than they were about Harrison Ford, a character that at that time they already knew he is already dead. Mm. I mean, I, I think that that could have been something that they could have played with and definitely got a lot more clicks on because everybody loves Yoda. Everyone does. And it's a mystery thing that even, I mean, we know back in 2012 when it first got to get taken over is the fact that they were definitely on the table as something to do with Yoda. I think it was quickly dismayed or put to side because it's it's one of those things. Lucas has never really wanted to delve into that. I think because they've never been able to come up with a satisfying way to get that mystery across, you know, or what, you know, what, what makes him so good. I mean, Yoda's great, but he's no Anakin Skywalker when it comes to, you know, the the amount of force or, uh, dare we say, midi-glorians. But, you know, look, mm-hmm. it's it's at the end of the day, it's about the potential of that character. He is the ultimate of that era of Jedi you know, as far as their knowledge. But, of course, it goes hand in hand, as we know in the story, the tragedy of all that is that they were very blinded by their faith. Yep. That's the motto of the prequel trilogy. That that was a big thing between Jin and and Kenobi was how can we do what we do and stay within our mandate? Mm -hmm. Prime directive. Yeah. It really is. Which, which when it comes to the uh, Rahara storyline, that's when I really got interested as to where the faults with the Jedi came. I can't wait to get that, uh, that was a Jedi Dooku or or whatever the the audio book is. Jedi Lost. just came out, just got released like two days ago. I look forward to hearing more about that because think about this, right? Dooku, even in canon, he's still part of the Lost 20. Yeah. The Lost 20 were Jedi Knights that left the Order for higher ideals, right? Higher ideals. Not because they had lesser ideals, because they thought even higher than the standards the Jedi placed on themselves. And so Qui-Gon left like that. I want to know more about what pushed him there. I mean, you know, in Legends, we found out that it was it was – Sidious and him, you know, getting twisted up in that and, and the fall of uh, Cypodeus and all that. But now, like, and everything I'm hearing, it sounds like this audio drama is definitely where we see the final straw that breaks his back. Whereas Legends always made it kind of seem like it was Jin's death, and that's when he left. Whereas right now, we found out he's already gone. He's mm-hmm. already left the orders, which is another definite change from what we had before. Yeah, he's chilling out on a casino in uh, Sereno. Just, you know, just knock him back. Chardonnay! Well, you look, there's, uh, yes, there's some ballet happening over here, and you have an orchestra over here, and yes, yes. It's very, all very classical, of course. See, he found a love for the halfling's uh, weed. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. It's, um, it's going to make a bit more drama if they split that up a bit and show the breakdown of this character, right? I can't wait. Now, I mean, that's the first thing I'm going to be downloading next is the, uh, straight onto the old iPod is, of course, that audio book. And I'm glad that they're finally doing it. They're finally doing what we, we all talked about, God, two or three years ago. Clone Wars gets r- riled up. 
And they straight away said, yeah, we're not doing any more Clone Wars. You've got all these talented voice actors. I mean, they're not mm-hmm. just people that work on audio books. And they're finally now freed up to come and do what Doctor Who and other British programs have been doing for years um, on Big Finish over in the UK. They just continue oh. these characters through audio books. And I guarantee you the amount of people that listen to those is going to make them gazillions of dollars. Mm-hmm. No, especially especially that throughput. You know, now you're sitting there and you're listening to that character. I mean, when they did that for uh, the Ahsoka novel, when they had Ashley Eckstein do the narration, I mean, that was huge. Um, you know, what I, I would love to have, though, is something where we have Mark Thompson doing all the narration and then just having the characters speaking the character lines. I mean, that's going to be a, a, a tremendous amount more editing and all that mm-hmm. than what you got going on right now. But I think the overall production would just be so great. Um, I, and I, I just, I'm looking forward to reading that one as it is. It'll be a good one, man. Just feel good. Oh, yeah. And I think at the end of the day, they can actually do a lot of that on Skype now or, or any of those. You know, I, they don't need to go into the studio. I mean, literally, you've got a script, but you just say the lines directed to you. You know, there's only so many lines each character is going to have in each of these productions. So mm-hmm. it, no matter how they react and stuff like that, I think, you know, um, it's just going to be amazing. And the amount of people they can pull in, but they don't have the CGI to worry about. They don't have all that physical stuff to actually worry about. Um, I think it's going to be making it a lot more coming our way. Right. Oh, yeah. What's the other one, too? Did you see uh, they had a preview for an up? Upcoming Claudia Gray book, but they released, they dropped the synopsis for a Kylo Ren story is coming. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Got me all excited there. I mean, you know, we've we've been hoping and figuring that once episode nine came out, we were going to get that backstory on Kylo, mm-hmm. Luke, the fall of his order. And for me, the most important thing, the conversation between Luke, Han, and Leia about what happened with Ben. I mean, I... That I think that right there is my biggest question and part of my biggest hang up with episode eight is that we have nothing there. And then when Luke and Leia do meet up, it's like none of that's ever mentioned. It's like I've missed you so much that it doesn't matter all this other stuff. And I want to know what that conversation was, because I really, truly feel like they blame Luke. Like I I want to say whether they meant to say it or not. I feel like there was that moment where Han had with Chewie where he was like. You left him up, you know, and, 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 you know, rest in peace to Peter Mayhew too. We just found out today that, uh, Very he passed sad, away yes. on the uh, 30th. Like that's, that's really sad. But I mean, I think, I think that we're going to get something like that where there was this, this moment where Han and Leia blame Luke. Uh, like we didn't want you to take him in the first place. And then not only did you screw it up, we lost our son to the damn dark side. Like I, and that added guilt. To me, that's what broke Luke. And granted, I that's all in my head right now. You know, that's just my way of trying to process this and come up with stuff to make what I saw on the film make more sense for me. Um, because for me, I think, you know, just him reaching for the lightsaber and then his, his nephew waking up and getting in a titty fit and just ripping everything apart, that doesn't play well. Now, having his sister and his brother-in-law rip into him for it all and be like, we never wanted you to have him in the first place. That's deep, man. That's some sting. I mean, and that's and I keep going back to you know we get to Vector Prime in Legends and when Anakin turns the ship and leaves Chewie behind and the planet crashes on him and when Han comes in and he flat out says you left him, you left him behind. You know that the way that that impacted Anakin, I feel like there's got to be something like that to happen to Luke. So yeah. to to get a story with Kylo Ren and the promise that. I say promise very loosely. They haven't promised us anything, but <laughs> the, the idea that they could go back to that moment and have that either be a flashpoint or even have the start of the story. You know, you watch that happen and then you watch where he goes from there. Either way you go about it, I can't wait to find out more about the character because I that for me, Kylo Ren and, and Rey are definitely the two characters that I'm the most curious about, the characters I've enjoyed the most with the sequel trilogy. Then comes Poe and then comes Finn. So, I mean, you know, the second tier cast for me has been the first class all the way around. And for me, the people that would have been my first class – the big three have been just, like, I have not been thrilled with what we've got. You know, I'm one of those like Mike Hamill when he shared that picture of all of them on there, what could have been. Granted, yeah, I've got that in Legends, but I, I've read all the Legends. There's nothing new aside from a comic that came out yesterday and one coming out at the end of the month. There's nothing new for me. Which sucks. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of canon stuff, but again, you know, I mean, I need my daughter Jana, so I mean, I want both universes. And the fact that Marvel can pull this off 
and produce a TV show, you know, an MCU that we're not arguing like, oh, it's not canon. Well, of course it's not canon. The comic books are canon. This is different. This is an alternate universe. You know, I, I'm starting to say that with Legends. I'm not calling it Legends anymore. I'm going to start calling it the Legends universe because people need to realize it's not just – Legends sounds like such a quick pass-off. Oh, well, it you know, does. It's just it Legends, man. It's disrespectful. Is you know, like, is. like the Legend of this, the Legend of that. Mm-hmm. No, Legends is a title in this case. It's just the Legends universe, a universe of stories, great stories. Oh, they Good really stories. are. And the thing is it's it's – it's something that will happen with this canon soon. You know, it'll happen in the next few years where it gets us all, all tied up and it doesn't mm-hmm. go with a director's vision. And they'll finally go, well, we're going to, it'll get to those different tiers of canon that oh. Lucas had years ago. It's, this, this is your Clone it's Wars canon. It's there loosely. It is, it is. Like they've, they've, they've pushed things there where they're like, well, the book came out a little bit later and then they made these changes. Because like mm-hmm. Finn gets struck in the book, he gets struck from up front. Yeah. Gets cut across the chest. Where in the you know the or in the show he gets cut from the back, and they've had a couple different things like that so far. But it's just it's getting to that point where yeah you know they're going to flat out say yeah well of course the films are going to always trump your books and of course your books are going to probably trump your comics and I mean eventually we are definitely going to have a tier system. They're just in my mind they're not going to say that right now. It's that whole thing like Leland Chi back before Disney bought it where he's like, as long as I'm in charge, there will always be one canon. Like, dude, there was two canons back then. You guys just didn't call it Legends at the time. You had all the fandom was at, at war over whether or not it was legit canon or mm-hmm. official canon or if it was canon at all. While everybody over at the Delray side was like, it's official canon. Sue Rustoni, Lee Wen Chi, it's official canon. It's all one. It's a, then why does, well, how does Clone Wars fit? We'll tell you when we get there. Oh, well, Disney bought it. We don't have to tell you anymore. It's Legends now. Or, this is canon. Yeah. And, it's, and how many times, has, happen, man. How many times happen. has he had to pull out to Nate to go, hey, Nate, is this right? Is this in the right timeline? And even Nate's gone, <laughs> you guys paying me for this? What's, what's going on? You know, like, <laughs> Right, I know, right? You know, they reach out to fans. I don't know how many times. I mean, look. Granted, they're employees. They they're probably not fans. Sometimes, some of them that work for it. It's just it is a work. It's a job, you know. But I think at the end of the day, what's interesting is that somebody has put so much passion into the timeline, especially the time and gold. Like Nate has just nailed it. I mean, I don't know how many of us have gone out there and gone, where does this fit? And then we go in and have a look, and it's just so well orchestrated. Hats off to to uh, Nate, mate. I tell you what, bloody awesome. I, I couldn't do it. Hey, can you imagine being like the one person working at Lucasfilm that, that's just, I, I don't like Star Wars. I've never even watched it. And they're like, how do you have this job? I'm really good at this one kind of model building. <laughs> <laughs> I love Star Trek. Star Trek's the greatest. Oh, oh, hi, Star Wars. <laughs> right. Everybody's like, oh, here comes Bill. Hi, Bill. Ah, Bill hates it. He just absolutely, he's a big, big Doctor Who fan. He don't care about anything but Doctor Who. Hey, hey, how you doing? This is Doctor Who. I'm here now. All right, these episodes are going to be two minutes long because I am Arnold and I will kill the master. Come on now. Now. <laughs> oh, well played, well played. Oh, nice, nice. But I, I think the biggest thing is we get, need to, before we wrap up today, have a, uh, a look at the trailer, what your thoughts are. This has come out, and, you know, look, I think it's a bit of a celebration of what these guys have put together, obviously. This team, JJ, then Ryan, and now JJ is back. And JJ's got a real, I think, um, hard job. You know, he's wrapping up not only... Is he wrapping up this trilogy? But he's got the tough task of doing it for three trilogies. Not only that, but every other story that's come through past. Do you think he's ready? I think I think he is. I, I think the one thing he gets the most flack for when it comes to The Force Awakens is it being too much like A New Hope. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's I think that is a legitimate criticize, criticism, but at the same time, I think that mm-hmm. that's a, a tribute to what he was sent to to do with that film you know he was sent to recapture that and i I think he did and he has mentioned time and time again the fact that he's very aware of that he's not wrapping up just one trilogy but three of them and you know how do we do that plus how do we work with the footage that we have of carrie fisher to make general leia the princess that we all love so much and do her the honor you know he's been very aware of so many things now 
while I may feel like they should have also used some CGI and some other stuff, they've been so aware of that, and then they felt so incredibly blessed by the footage that they have that they felt that they pulled it off, which tells me that he had a plan, and what they were able to find in the archive footage was more than enough to suit the needs of that plan. Uh I, what I look forward to the most is I have a feeling this is going to be a long film and not in the run of minutes, but like how certain books take, you know, like Master and Apprentice, right? It's it's over a span of, say, like a month. Mm -hmm. Some are, are a five year book. You know, you get mm -hmm. to uh, Rebel Rising and that's, the you know, you see Jin go from age three to the age she is at the beginning of that. I'm anticipating something like that. We're going to have a jump forward in time. But I also feel like we're going to see the story progress also. Like there'll be months between some scenes and stuff, and we'll see a jump in time. Or or the jump in time is going to be so far forward that that allows for a lot of the story to be told in either prose or in backstory or just a quick reference to events in that form or fashion. And they can allow the prose to come back and fill that in later. Um, because of the fact that there's just so much and the fact that he is focused on those three trilogies, and that means there's so many more characters than what we have just in this one trilogy to bring forward, which kind of makes sense then why you would hear Palpatine laughing there at the end because, I mean, who's one of the major characters of the first six films? Well, it's all about Palpatine rising to power and Palpatine's fall. Uh, you know, and one of the big themes of Legends was Palpatine coming back from the dead. You know, we saw that hinted at with the whole Plagueis learn the trick. You know, it's a trick that my master learned. Um, so to see that, you know, it, it also touches on the whole dark empire. I mean, you know, we saw that happen. Mm -hmm. That was what happened when he died at Endor. The spirit of Palpatine went out and found one of the first hands that he could get close to. Yep. I think it was like Asriel or something like that. And then traveled from that body in Asriel all the way back to Biss where he had the other clones. And then he dumped in there. I mean, that was always a story I was hoping for in Legends. You know, we knew that Palpatine was using clones. Uh, we knew that he had cloned Jorah Sabath. And we knew that that didn't go well. And it was always like, you know, at what point did Palpatine leave his body and start using the clone bodies? Because it was always hinted at that the clone bodies, or at least his mastership of the dark side, was so much that it ate up the clones. Or that the clones were imper imperfect enough that they couldn't contain the power. And that that was part of why he looked so wrinkly, was that the power of the dark side was eating him alive from the inside. So it was always that question of, well, when did he start doing it? You know, like, I kept waiting for, uh, during the... The Force Unleashed to find out that Galen was actually a clone of Palpatine. Like that was the the clone process. They were trying to perfect the clones for Palpatine, mm. and then once he had the perfect way of cloning the body, he was just going to take over the body. But they didn't go that route. But I kept waiting for that man. Like that would have been oh, such yeah. a great moment. So, so when they have him laughing, like my brain just immediately blew up, and I started thinking about all the possibilities. You know, I mean, we don't have Force ghosts that are dark side spirits, but we yet we do. You know, you go to Dathomir and you see him. They're trapped on on. You know the 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 grounds basically that the Night Sisters lived in. You have uh, Mammon from the Dark uh, the Darth Vader comic where he's trapped in the mask basically. Um, you know, and that was always how it was in Legends. They were they were trapped in places. There was never a Force ghost that really could roam around. I think the closest we got to that was Revan when they had that whole you know out of body thing where there's two Revans as dark and his light side were split, which would would be another killer story to get, but. Yeah, when I heard him laughing, we see the Death Star, I immediately was thinking, like, okay, he's got to be trapped in there. You know, like, that's now basically the urn for Palpatine. And whatever they got to go in there, if they're going inside there to get something, like, oh, my God, could you just imagine that being, like, a ride <laughs> at some place? Like, Knott's Berry Farm, where they got the, you know, escape from Endor, the Death Star experience. <laughs> you just imagine, you know, uh, Finn, Ray, and Poe, they're climbing, you know, out of a boat into the wreckage of the Death Star, and they just see this crummy old dude with a you know overcoat, probably got a little bit of windshield here and a hoodie, and he's just got a fishing rod. <laughs> <laughs> I caught another one. <laughs> well, see, and then, and then if, if we're talking force possessions and stuff, I mean, imagine if Poe or Finn gets taken over. Ooh, you know, like yes. I mean, what that do for Ray, especially if it was like Finn or something. You know, someone she's pretty close to, which she's got a question: Do I take out this guy, or you know, like? Or if it's Poe and he's got Finn like under the knife, like does she take Poe out? Like ah, there's so many possibilities with the teaser. And then I, I keep going back to well, episode one teaser had that great scene of the Gungans on their little uh, EOPs coming out of the fog with the little feathers and wow, 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 oh, kind of that oh, uh, yeah. that didgeridoo sound that they had going and stuff. And I was like, oh my god, that battle would be so awesome, right? Yeah. And then that moment happened in the movie, and I was just like, 
what, what, what? That, that was it? I'm like, wow, that was, it was like the Battle of Winterfell and everyone's going, it's too dark. I, I, I can't see. I was like, where's my battle? I, there's supposed to be a battle happening here. <laughs> <laughs> I remember saying something about that. I was talking to a couple of pals at work and they're, they're, they're have you seen the, the Winterfell episode where they got the battle happening? I said, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I couldn't see a damn thing, Dan. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Oh, well, you know, it was just, I turned up the, the contrast and the brightness on my TV. No matter what I did, I just couldn't get a picture. I said, so you didn't see the armies of the Night King, yeah? No, I couldn't see nothing. I said, you know, <laughs> I, I think at the end of the day, they, they really, um, you know, again, another thing, Battle is Chaos. I love that. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what it should be. I mean, look, not everything's going to be as clear-cut and as pastel-coloured as Star Wars, which is you know, very clear, you know, and everything is pulled back quite well. It's not Christopher Nolan and Batman Begins where he goes, I want to see the fight dirty, you know, I want to see it, you know, really close. And so all you see is fists and, and legs going past because apparently Bale was shown some type of fighting in that that was, yeah, it's grubby, it's it's grounded, but... We don't get to see it because he's going, I just want to see the arms moving. Right. And then they learnt that on the second one. The, the, you know, they, they said, um, Chris, we need to see the actual action. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll pull back the camera now, you know. And, of course, we got one of the, probably the greatest comic book movies ever, The Dark Knight. I, sorry, Marvel, mm -hmm. but it is better than all of your films. It really is. <laughs> want to see my scars? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is brilliant. I'm. I'm. I can't wait for episode nine and just to see that. That you can see the sheer excitement they all have about this. I mean, you've had Force mm -hmm. Awakens, which in ways is an homage to what's come before, it introduced us to new characters. Ryan's come along yep. and by rights given us a very challenging film, which most second films are. Um, Empire Strikes Back certainly was. Attack of the Clones. Hmm. Um, but <laughs> you know, I think at the end of the day. Uh, we're in for something very exciting, so uh, I can't wait. But where can the folks, it's, you know, find the the same feel? Is it in the Mandalorian? Where are they, where are they going to find this? Oh man, which which one are you talking? More the the Game of Thrones type of feel? Oh, or, well, or not even that. I, I think you know, feel. like we're, we're you know we're wrapping up a, a series of films here. Obviously, they're taking a break. But um, do you think Mandalorian is going to be what people are going to be driving towards? I mean, we got Star Wars Resistance. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, no. So, I think resistance. I think resistance is going to stand on its own for a little while. I think that they need to really start stepping past where they've been in the first two seasons to really capture the rest of the fan base. Uh -huh. um, and I say that loosely because I, I haven't watched a lot of it yet. I've only seen a couple episodes, but from what I've seen, it, it hasn't been enough to really pull me in for it so uh -huh. far. Whereas the thought of what's going on with the Mandalorian. I, there's so much promise there of what could be, you know, what they could do. You know, if you could bring in, you know, the the, the rumor or the mm -hmm. legend of Boba Fett, you could bring Boba Fett in and find out, you know, he did actually escape the Sarlacc pit some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. Find out a leg. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, but I think, you know, when you got that, you've got so much potential because that's a, a theme of not just – rebels but mm. of legends you know legends oh, had is. Yeah, yeah, three definitely. major factors you had the jedi the sith and the mandalorians granted by the time we came into it by the time a new hope came out the mandalorian faction was decimated there was just boba fett as far as we knew right yeah uh so they didn't play much of a role but as we went back into the prequel trilogy as we went back into the old republic they did have a bigger role in things so now we've got that aspect and then what do we get getting clone wars and rebels we get a lot more mandalorians so they're definitely oh, playing yeah. in more so they've also existed farther in fact they've existed more than the jedi there are more mm -hmm. mandalorians out there than there are jedi which is kind of a bummer but <laughs> but i think that again that, that that's something that they're going to be able to explore because even though the Clone Wars and Rebels didn't take a lot of what Karen Travis did for the Mandalorians, right? You think about what she did for the Mandalorians and what the Mandalorian mercs have done for the, mm -hmm. the Mandalorians in the real world side of things. You know, like she she helped flesh out a culture. You know, she fleshed out a language for him and all this kind of stuff. And if you take some of those elements and bring them in, the cherry picking that canon has always done with the EU. Yeah. Uh, you know, you bring that kind of stuff in. 
there is so much there just before we get what we got in the Clone Wars and Rebels, which is a lot. I mean, they give us a lot of those. Hate. You take those things and you combine them together that you can really create a universe that feels as in-depth as what we're going to get with Galaxy's Edge. And I think that depending on where the story goes with The Mandalorian, I think The Mandalorian could easily be a show that people are flocking to like they are Game of Thrones right now. Oh, yeah, definitely. Look, and I think that's it. There's just so much they can – I mean, you got to think about it. There was so much going into – these streaming services, not just from Star Wars base. I mean, you've got things like um, the UK, they've got um, Mega City 1, which was going ahead. It's just been, unfortunately, folks, they've dropped it. It's not going to happen uh-huh. now, which is really, really sad. But I'm hoping that this maybe gets them to green light another Carl Urban Dread, which is one of the best comic adaptations that's been done in the last 10 years. Um, you know, I don't think it's talked about enough. That's a great film. Uh, but also, uh, Duncan Jones, David Bowie Jr., the one, the only uh, director of Moon and director of Warcraft, is doing one on Rogue Trooper from 2000 AD. Now, this is little known elsewhere around the place, unless you're a, a, a reader of 2000 AD and obviously Judge Dredd. That was a, one of the great series that was in those multi-packs of comics. But with Duncan Jones behind an adaptation, this is going to get some wacky sci-fi coming. <laughs> it is going to be wacky. Kind of like, like Tag and Binks kind of wacky? or uh, oh, uh, Just eccentric but action-packed. Like it's, they're tough tough characters, you know. It's, it's Judge Dredd style, man. It's nice. it's right out there, like Strontium Dog and all those. So, you know, if, so if you guys in the US that probably haven't had 2000 AD yet, as much because it usually goes to the Commonwealth countries like Canada and Australia, et cetera, New Zealand, check them out because they're really good. And they come in those massive jumbo size. So we're talking about the size of a newspaper. You go... Oh, yeah, this is a fantastic comic. This is, oh, Duke Judge Dredd, and Freeze Citizen, what are you doing? You know, like, and he's got he's that huge lawgiver. You know, it'll, it'll have flame control, it'll have pacifier, you know, it goes rapid fire, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's brilliant. Check it out. But I must say, you, what you do need to check out is the Star Wars report, and of course, Star Wars Beyond the Films, because this gentleman right here is part of one of the most exciting shows out there. Tell the folks at home how to catch on. Well, you can catch all the uh, second airborne shows at StarWarsReport.com, www.StarWarsReport.com. Uh, you can find great shows on their bookworms. They had their 100th episode uh, at Celebration. They just celebrated their 100th episode. Uh, Wampa's Lair is on there. We've got Ion Cannon. We've got Cloud City Casino uh, that my co-host Nathan does with Michael Morris. Uh, Padawan's Perspective, it's kind of been on a hiatus. Uh, you know, Baron has had a lot of stuff going on. Haven't had a chance to get back on that one, but that's one I used to do with my daughter and his son and and him. We would talk about Rebels and stuff, and then we were hoping to get into Resistance, but big hiatus. So hopefully I'll be able to get that one going. I've talked to my wife off, or not my wife, my sister. Oh, my God, my daughter. <laughs> Those other two things. Uh, we've talked to her a few times about maybe her and I just doing it for a little bit just to get done with the Rebels stuff and then seeing uh, about picking up with Resistance and going on that. Um, but, yeah, and you can find me on Logical Rogue 2 on Twitter and out there on Facebook as myself, Mark Herleman. Thank God on Facebook I'm just a Logical Rogue. They wouldn't let me put the number two in. Something about character limits or something. <laughs> vicious like that but yeah i'm all over the web i'm even on instagram just drop me a line say hi <laughs> so you go and check out the shows folks because i tell you what i've been a big fan before even i was a podcaster and you know i'd be sitting in there whether it was working as a janitor or at uni or whatever it was and it was you know after obviously reading each of the books i'd always catch on to the interviews that were done on your show and um even interviews one of the best ones karen miller out there, you know, doing interviews years ago for the Clone Wars Gambit series. Uh, there you go. Yeah. From Australia, you know, and then that was a great series because we got to see also Bail Organa's friendship with Kenobi Grow and, um, yeah, just great, great work back then, pal. So, folks, go and mm-hmm. check it out. This is Zanamo O'Brien, Phantom from Down Under, here from Quinlan's Canteen on the Gold Coast of Australia. Give you, may the Force be with you, and I believe it is almost May the 4th. So, may the 4th be with you. This is Mark Curlin from the Star Wars Report, and you're listening to Fanta Tracks Radio. G'day, how you going? This is how you can catch me on the web. That's right, your host, Adam O'Brien, the Fanta from Down Under. You can catch it, Obi Pop Culture, on both Twitter and Instagram. You can also catch me on the one, the only, Fanta Podcast Network's Lethal Mullet Podcast. But yeah, check out Fanta Tracks itself. Check it out at fantatracks.com. All your Star Wars news in one single file.